All right, welcome to the John David Ebert School for the Study of Culture, Cosmology, and the Arts. Um, we're moving on now into the evolution of media studies. So this first class will just be an orientation, just to kind of fly by a uh, bird's eye overview of the terrain. Now, um, most of what happens with media studies comes out of the University of Toronto, uh, with Marshall McLuhan being really the center of focus and all of these other guys sort of orbiting around him. Some of them are uh, one or two. Uh, Siegfried Gideon uh, is Swiss, uh, doesn't come out of the American milieu. Uh, Louis Mumford is uh, American, however, and I want to emphasize him because of his influence on McLuhan. Um, the influence of Lewis Mumford's Technics and Civilization uh, is tremendous. And it came out in 1934, and it really is the first big book uh, to study technology in the abstract, other than Oswald Spengler's very short book, which came out before it in Germany, Man and Technics, I believe in 1932. Um, but this is the first big one, and Mumford goes through and gives a very thorough analysis. He says here that the first draft was written in 1930, and the second completed in 1931. Um, and he goes through the history of technology, um, and he divides it into these three distinct phases called the eotechnic phase, uh, where the motive forces are wood, water, and wind, uh, the creaky world of Dutch windmills and uh, sailing ships and so forth, and then the paleotechnic phase, which comes in with industry, the rise of the industrial world, uh, where the motive forces are iron and coal and steam. And then finally, the neotechnic phase that comes in with electricity and the rise of the electric world. Now, that will these three epochs will definitely have an influence on uh, McLuhan, as we'll see when we go through him. And uh, so the other big influence that I think is important to take into account is this book here, Mechanization Takes Command by Siegfried Gideon. Um, and I believe this was written, let's see, it was in the if I remember, in the late 1940s, 48, okay. Um, 1948, where um, it's heavily illustrated. Uh, it takes a different... G G Zipri Gideon was Swiss, and so it takes a different approach. Uh, he calls it anonymous history because there's so little when you go to study American technology, the evolution of it, almost none of it has much in the way of records, good records that were kept I think the way that Europeans would have done so. Um, it's just not there. And uh, so he calls it anonymous history. The great thing about this book is, is the illustrations. It is jam-packed with illustrations. He goes through and he starts with um, different kinds of motion. Um, and then when he gets to this interesting sort of main first chapter, after this sort of introductory material here, he talks about how the assembly line originates out of the slaughterhouses of Cincinnati in the 19th century. That is the birth of the assembly line that will, of course, lead to its apotheosis with Ford's assembly line. Um, and here he's talking about uh, standardization and, t and interchangeability. Uh, lots of great illustrations, and he goes through and just analyzes everything. He has an incredible eye for detail. I highly recommend this book, and it was hugely influential uh, on McLuhan, as well as his earlier book, Space, Time, and Architecture, uh, which for anybody who um, anybody who needs an introduction to the history of architecture, I, I would say this would be it. My friend, the professor of architecture, John LaBelle, uh, who teaches at Pratt, uh, agrees with me on that. The exact same thing. He says, I start this book with all my students. Uh, I have them read this first. And this one is also very thoroughly illustrated, and it goes through the history of Western technology primarily. Uh, and it culminates with the rise of the skyscraper, out of Chicago and New York, uh, nearing the end of the 19th century in the 1880s. Uh, and uh, th this is also an excellent book. For those of you who want to be really thorough about going back and reading through McLuhan's influences, uh, these are the books to read. Gideon, these two books by Gideon, and uh, almost anything by Lewis Mumford, but especially um, Technics and Civilization and its sequel, The Culture of Cities. Those are the two big ones uh, from him. Okay, and then so, now, McLuhan put, put, puts out his first book, The Mechanical Bride, and this comes out, I believe it's published in 1951, The Folklore of Industrial Man, and it too, probably under the influence of Gideon, is thoroughly illustrated. Um, it was much, much longer when it was first put out, and so 
Uh, McClune was forced by the publisher to restrict a lot of it and cut a lot of it. And there were plans later on by a publisher in California called Ginkgo Press to put out the unexpurgated version of it, but I don't think they ever got around to it. Uh, so what he does in this book is he goes through and he looks at various media, uh, primarily print media, newspapers, advertisements, um, cheap, tawdry paperbacks, uh, newspapers out of Time magazine, and he analyzes them for content now because he has not yet read Harold Innes and he does not yet know that the medium is the message. Uh, but this is all very good. It's very witty. Um, it's, it's not vintage McLuhan quite yet with, from the classic phase of understanding media, uh, but it is, it is very witty and funny. Uh, McLuhan is very funny. He has a great uh, sense of humor, almost a kind of, uh, in Finnegan's Wake was his favorite book, a, a kind of Joycean sense of humor. Uh, as he goes through and analyzes all of this uh, content. I, I recommend reading this book. But in the meantime, as he's at teaching at University of Toronto, his colleague there, Harold Innes, whom I don't think that he, he knew personally, I don't get that sense, sort of behind his back, as it were, uh, put out <clears throat> two books. And Innes had been a specialist. He had written a book on the fur trade in Canada, some specialist stuff before this. But media studies really begins here. Uh, more than with anything or anywhere else. Harold Innes, Empire and Communications, and here later uh, his wife has revised it and it brought McLuhan in to write a forward to a later edition of it. Uh, and this is the book that we will be reading next week. This is the one that we'll be starting with. Uh, so this comes out in 1950. And uh, it goes through the history of media, starting with ancient Sumer, uh, ancient Mesopotamia, and then goes to ancient Egypt. And its focus is on, although Innes doesn't coin the phrase, uh, the medium is the message. Uh, nonetheless, that is the point of the book, because for Innes, it matters whether a civilization, I guess he starts with Egypt and then goes to Babylon, which is the late phase of the Mesopotamian civilization after the Sumerians. It matters whether a civilization writes in hieroglyphics on papyrus, versus whether it writes in cuneiform on clay tablets. Both media have their limitations, and both have something to do with the way in which the entire society is organized. On a center-periphery model, um, papyrus works better for imperial expansion, and so forth. And then he'll go through, he'll look at the, the tradition, the oral tradition, and then Greek civilization with the incoming of the alphabet, um, and the writing from left to right, uh, with the Greeks who invent writing left to right. Um, the written tr traditions of the Roman Empire. The Romans invent the book as we know it, as opposed to the scroll. The Greeks are still using the scroll, which they've the papyrus scroll or vellum sometimes that they've inherited from the Egyptians. The Egyptians had a monopoly on papyrus, by the way, um, and um, they invent the Romans in invent the book, the Codex, uh, initially as a series of pages that are wax tablets, like you write in. Um, like a tablet with a stylus and you inscribe in it and then you can lift the page and erase it. Um, kind of like an Etch-A-Sketch, if any of you remember that uh, childhood toy. And so they invent the codex. And uh, note that the Hebrews are still writing on uh, scrolls. They prefer scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, whereas the Christians from the beginning are writing on codices. Uh, they, they prefer the codex, the flat book with a... Eventually, it, it grows a spine. Uh, so we get parchment versus paper, the whole transition into the Middle Ages, the rivalry between parchment and paper, um, paper coming in from the East. Uh, the Muslims, I think, introduce it to the West, um, and initially it's made up out of rags. You, you take rags and shred them and shred them and shred them and crush them to a pulp until you have pages. Uh, so he analyzes that and the rise, he concludes this book here with the rise of the printing press, that the, the impact of uh, the mechanization, what McLuhan calls the macadamization of reading. The printing press streamlines reading uh, and in the same way that's analogous to the way the road makes ease of facilitation of automobiles. It, it macadamizes it. Um, and this is the other book that he put out, The Bias of Communication. Uh, this book, The Bias of Communication, uh, it came out the next year, I believe it's 1951. That one was 50. This is 51. And notice the, in, the very crucial idea in the title, the bias of communication. Every form of communication has its own bias. Um, and this is a key idea with Innes, that all media have a bias. Neil Postman, whom we won't have time to read in, in this course, 
I feel a little guilty about leaving him out because Neil Postman is also very good. In his short book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, he says, the bias of television is entertainment. Uh, so even political debate is streamlined and cut down for quick, rapid-fire uh, question-response, question-response, uh, and it's, it's streamlined for entertainment. Everything that goes through uh, television for Neil Postman is all about entertainment. He says in that book that Sesame Street did not teach kids how to read. It taught them how to, how to like television. Uh, it taught them television as a, as a mode of entertainment. So uh, in this book, um, <clears throat> and his focus is on the West, uh, bias of communication, um, mostly the evolution of books and newspapers, uh, the birth of the novel, the, the first newspaper, which the Dutch invent in the 17th century in order to keep track of the, the stock market. Um, and so this, this is focused on the evolution of Western technology. Both books are superb. I highly recommend both of them. So now once McLuhan reads these two books, it hits him like a bombshell that the medium is indeed the message. So <clears throat> it takes him about a decade for him to publish The Gutenberg Galaxy in 1962 and Understanding Media in 1964. And in that decade, what we have for him, from him is a series of essays. Uh, he's giving lectures and essays, and those were collected by Ginkgo Press, the ones who were thinking about putting out uh, the unexpurgated edition of The Mechanical Bride. As McLuhan Unbound, <clears throat> because it doesn't have a spine, each essay is like a pamphlet. You just pull it out. It's a really cool book. But it, it it's tantamount to a missing book. It itself is the next book after The Mechanical Bride. So it's a missing book because in it is where McLuhan works out all his basic concepts, the difference between acoustic space and visual space, and how visual space is visual in the abstract sense, not in the pictorial sense. Somewhat confusingly, he identifies pictorial space with acoustic space, with electric space. So we'll get into all those definitions. And he's working all that out in these essays during this period. Um, the essays are excellent. Also highly recommend it for you completists. Um, and then, yeah, so then it's a double whammy with the, the, uh, the Gutenberg Galaxy uh, that comes out in 1962. Now, the Gutenberg Galaxy is probably McLuhan's most difficult book to read because he mostly focuses on the Middle Ages in this book. He goes through uh, the whole concept of illuminated manuscripts. And it's in this book that he makes the distinction between media that involve light through versus media that involve light on. Light through... Uh, think of stained glass, the light through the stained glass. Think of an illuminated manuscript, uh, illuminations. Um, all of that has to do with the medieval world of light through. Whereas with light on, we come in with the printing press. You, you need a candlelight to sit down and read it. And it puts light on things. Uh, it sheds light on things. Uh, so he makes that distinction. He, uh, he discusses the plays of Shakespeare here in the beginning with uh, King Lear. Um, the interiorization of the technology of the phonetic alphabet translates man from the magical world of the ear to the neutral visual world. Uh, the magical world of the ear is orality, what uh, his pupil, the father Walter Ahn, calls orality versus literacy, the visual world that comes in with the printing press. Um, so he starts working those ideas out. But it's a very difficult book to read because the references are so obscure if you don't know, if you don't have an ex a scholastic education. But that's not the case with his most popular book, and really, not only his magnum opus, but pretty much the apotheosis of this whole development, understanding media, the extensions of man. Uh, he goes through, he takes particular, spends a lot of time on, on the impacts of television. Television, for, for McLuhan, is a tactile medium, not a visual one, which is, and it's, it's a low-res medium, so it's, it's a cool medium, versus a hot media, such as print, which are maximum definition, uh, a maximum input of information, uh, and so it's hot. Whereas when media cools down, as with comics and with theater and with uh, movie theaters, rather, uh, it, it cools down, especially with television, because the images are low res and they invite further participation on the part of the viewer, on the part of the audience, such as syncopation in jazz. Notes are left out you are meant to fill in the missing notes. And so that's a cool medium. Uh, cool media involve uh, very strong audience participation. Our entire civilization has cooled off in terms of media, in terms of these definitions that McLuhan talks about in understanding media. 
And this also, this idea that he has, that media are extensions of men, actually comes from Arnold Toynbee. I'm pretty sure that Marshall McLuhan uh, read a study of history because there are exact paragraphs, and I came across them recently when in, uh, we did the class on philosophies of history, and I reread the study of history where it's Toynbee who, who's talking about how technology, or all of it, is extensions of the human body. Uh, but So McLuhan makes that the focus of this book. For example, the, the wheel is an extension of the foot. Clothing is an extension of the skin. Your house is an extension of the immune system. And then later he'll say that the computer is an extension of the central nervous system, outward. It's outered, as he calls it, into space. And um, so he will go through this book. And in a way, it's it's very sim- It's kind of a rewrite, in, in a way, of uh, uh, that first book, The Mechanical Bride, where he goes through and he looks at all this different media. Um, he looks at everything from comic books to Mad Magazine to board games to and from it should be said that for McLuhan, media includes not just different forms of communication, uh, whether orality, literacy, the alphabet, pictographic writing, or what have you, but also uh, technology. That's why the technological books that I started with are so important uh, of, of an influence, uh, an important an influence on, on McLuhan here. And then so yes, he just goes through number and clothing, housing, money, clocks. Uh, I like how one of his witty aphorisms is right here. Money, the poor man's credit card. <laughs> and McLuhan was a master of witty aphorisms. Um, and one-line sentences that were not just aphorisms, but, but he called them probes because he sends them out like depth charges into the psyche. Uh, the press, uh, the automobile here, ads, games, the telegraph, the typewriter, the telephone, the phonograph, movies, radio, television, weapons, automation. So he has something to say about each of these forms of media and their effects on us. And he has this idea, too, in this book about escape uh, through understanding. Uh, you escape from the control of the biases of the media through understanding how they work and how they manipulate you. That gives you a certain degree of ability to step around and outside them so that they don't just control your perceptions in your life. We get so much news right now that's pure propaganda. That is, that is coming to people through news outlets like CNN and Fox News and so forth. And it's all, it's all war propaganda. That's all it is. But the average person on the street who has not had an education in media studies thinks it's all real. They think it's actually the, 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 the way things are actually going, and it's not correct. Um, you have to be able to think critically about media so that you don't let it control your life uh, and push you around. Now, I will say that the best thing, we're not going to read this book, uh, but this is the best introduction to McLuhan. The medium is the massage, an inventory of effects that was written when he was at the height of his fame in the 1960s. And uh, uh, 1967 here, and it's all thoroughly illustrated. Uh, I guess they don't have it. I thought that, uh, yeah. Uh, so you can go through it, and it's full of illustrations. And it's, McLuhan, I, I won't say that it's dumbed down, because it isn't. Uh, but it is McLuhan writing for a general audience and an audience who might have thought that understanding media was, even though it was a bestseller, uh, might have thought that it was too difficult. This book is not difficult at all. And uh, it really is an excellent introduction to just his way of handling media, which is witty, uh, funny, uh, and utterly brilliant all the way through. Um, so I would start with this book. You might even, because it's very short, you might even sneak it in before before we do the class on understanding media. I, I think it will help. There's also another collection of his lectures called Understanding Me, which is lectures and interviews edited by his daughter. Uh, that's also a good starter book. Um, and then with regard to the McLuhan Circle, we have uh, Father Walter Ong. Uh, his book here, Orality and Literacy, uh, this comes out, I believe, in 1980, if I remember, 82. Uh, so it's a bit later, but Ong has been writing very obscure books uh, up to this point um, that are specialized analyses of literacy in the Middle Ages and during the Renaissance. This really is his first book that's an overview about how he talks about the structure of orality and the structure of literacy. And then there's a third phase, actually, which is called, which he calls the... the the return back to orality. It's, it's post-literacy with electronics. Uh, he calls that the post-literate epic. Um, they, have, they have two completely different structures of consciousness. 
they're almost as different from each other as Gene Gebser in The Ever-Present Origin when he's talking about the five different consciousness structures through history, how the mythical consciousness structure is totally different from the mental rational consciousness structure. Same thing here on, on um, talks about the structure of consciousness of orality and the structure of consciousness of literacy. They're totally different. And he gives a different kind of analysis uh, than McLuhan does. Um, it's a little more straightforward, uh, uh, streamlined and stripped down, straight to the point as he goes through. And you learn all kinds of wonderful things in this book. It's written in a kind of academic style, not really for a popular audience, but uh, it is excellent. So we'll be reading this as well. It's an excellent book. <clears throat> okay. And then, uh, so then we have this guy, Philip Flusser, is really interesting here. He's a bit of an anomaly in this group because uh, it says here he was born in Prague in 1920, but he emigrated to Brazil. He was a Jew, uh, a German Jew, because he had to flee from Nazi persecution uh, at the outbreak of war in 39, and then wound up uh, in Rio de Janeiro at the end of 1940, where he sort of invented his own media studies, almost entirely independent. He may not even have heard of McLuhan, for all I know, uh, in the 1970s. And these are the two books I want to look at, and I want to see if we can do them both together in one class, uh, because they're both very short, but both incredibly interesting. Does writing have a future? And then into the universe of technical images. Um, he also has a really good book on photography here, what's it called, Towards a, uh, Towards a Philosophy of Photography, in which uh, this influenced my book, The New Media Invasion, uh, when I have a, discuss I have a chapter on, on digital photography in that book where he talks about there is no such thing as taking a photograph that is an objective portrait of what you're looking at. It's not objective. There's nothing objective about it. And here again, we have bias, the bias of the medium. Um, when you take, let's say you take a, a good old fashioned Polaroid snapshot uh, of someone's lawn and we have the green grass on the lawn, what is the camera is recording is not the green of the grass. It's recording a theory about how the grass ought to look that has been programmed into the camera. And this is true uh, whether we're taking black and white, whether we're taking color. Every image is a theory that has been a priori programmed into the camera. It's a little bit like German idealist philosophy, like where Immanuel Kant talks about the a priority of space and time and causality. The mind brings those uh, with it to make sense out of experience. Same thing here with photography for Flusser. Uh, the camera has its own a priori uh, theories about what it's going to record, and it records what you have told it to record. Now, there's nothing objective about it. Um, brilliant little book. We're not going to read that one, but I, I do highly recommend it, uh, especially if you have any interest in photography. And also, this book, too, is really good. Uh, Writings. It's a, just a collection of his essays. It's kind of equivalent to McLuhan Unbound, that collection of essays, which are sort of random essays from across a decade uh, this makes an excellent companion volume to these these other three here. Um, it also has some other interesting books. Uh, Post History uh, is also very good, and there's some other stuff. Uh, he's kind of a general philosopher, not just a media studies uh, thinker. Um, so his his big day was in the during the 70s and the and the 80s. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll look at Leonard Schlein, Leonard Schlein's book here, The Alphabet versus the Goddess. And, which came out in the 90s, and uh, he had already written Art and Physics, Parallel Visions in Space and Time, which is really good, um, talking about the connections between modernist art and uh, theories of physics of the time. Uh, and then he has two other books before he died, Sex, Time, and Power, uh, and Leonardo's Brain. I've read the first two. I, won't, I wouldn't go anywhere near the third. It's all about... Uh, the absurd idea of, of gyna sapiens or it's ridiculous and it's kind of a cock book uh, actually uh and leonardo's brain um now i knew Schlein. i met him in san francisco and we traded books he gave me alphabet versus the goddess i had heard it also be recommended to me by william Irwin thompson and i read it and was blown away by it and he read my book um cellulite heroes and mechanical dragons and he liked it so much that he, he had a book idea that the two of us could collaborate on, but it, it never came to fruition. I guess he ended up working on the Leonardo book, which I believe he left unfinished at the time of his death. So this really fascinating book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, um, it is very interesting because he comes up with the idea, he's talking about the hemispheres in this book, where the left hemisphere is associated with language, 
uh, it's in concepts and conceptual abstract thinking, whereas the right hemisphere is associated with images, uh, hence with myths. And so the two are in conflict throughout history. And he says that whenever a culture picks up writing, and it doesn't have to be even alphabetic writing, just when it picks up writing at all, it tends to create a misogynistic bias within that culture. So he goes through history and he looks at all the different civilizations. He starts just like Harold Innes does with the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians. And he goes through and, look at, and looks at how writing biases these cultures once they are moved from morality into a literary mentality, uh, they become misogynistic. So it's a really fascinating book. I, I'm not interested in his goddess worship or in his bowing to the female, uh, but it does contain, Schlein was very literate and uh, easy to read and very sharp. A lot of, a lot of really sharp stuff in, in this book. So this is in the 1990s. And then finally, we'll read my book, uh, this guy, John David Ebert, The New Media Invasion, Digital Technologies, and the World They Unmake. Um, and that subtitle was inspired by Neil Postman's idea that every new technology which comes along, the one thing we never ask is, what way of life is this new technology going to unmake? For example, Jane Jacobs talking about the automobile. Oh, great. So now we have freedom of mobility through space. We can drive long distances. We can do what Heidegger said. We can make the far near and the near far. Fantastic. So what world does it unmake for Jane Jacobs? It unmakes neighborhoods and communities because of uh, the elastic effect it has with urban sprawl. It destroys neighborhoods and communities. People no longer know each other. You don't know who your neighbors are in a suburb and you don't care. Um, so this is a question that Postman always asks. Uh, he was very skeptical about technology. Anytime a new technology comes along, you should be very skeptical about the trade-off. What is the hidden thing that they're not telling you? That Steve Jobs is not telling you that digital technology, for instance, will destroy the analog world. The world I grew up with, with shopping malls and then analog technology, cassette tapes and records and VCRs and this wonderful uh, vinyl recordings. Um, Steve Jobs doesn't tell you that. He doesn't tell you that, that that's the trade-off. And if the trade-off is a better thing, well, okay. But you should be at least conscious of, of what... Uh, what, what kind of raw deal you might be being offered. Um, so that with the new media evasion then, I published this in 2011 um, with a publisher um, out of North Carolina. Um, an okay publisher, but after this I got completely disillusioned with publishing. They, they steal all your monies and give you pretty much nothing. Um, I, I've had a much better time. I did My first five books were all published with traditional publishers didn't make any money from them. Uh, they didn't give me any money, and what money they made, they kept. And um, so I left and uh, switched to Amazon self-publishing on here on, on uh, Amazon, and um, have made a lot more money since uh, than I ever would have made from any of these books. I think I may get a check once a year for about thirty bucks off of this book, um, whereas I would get that thirty bucks a month off of this book if I published it on Amazon. And uh, so it's not it's not much more, but it, it is a significant difference. Uh, so people like it, I guess. Here it has ten ratings, four and a half stars. So that's that's good. Even though I never read people's reviews, I, I long since stopped doing that. Um, so I put this out in 2011 because I wondered. I, I had gone to a Tower Records that was up the street from me in uh, Colorado, where I was living at the time, and uh, it was closed. And I went home and looked on the internet and found that Tower Records was not, that location was not not only closed, but Tower Records was gone out of business, and that hit me like a like a thunderbolt. What are you talking about? What do you mean Tower Records is gone? Then I started paying attention to, uh, with the rise of the internet, how all these analog media have disappeared. Magazines, newspapers, all kinds of my favorite magazines are, are no longer being published. Newspapers, literary quarterlies disappearing. Um, this hit me as a kind of alarm, and I think the initial title I had was the new media, uh, the new media extinction. I think was the initial title I had. The publisher made me change it, but new media invasion's fine. Um, and so I, I wondered, well, what if McLuhan were living today? What would he have made of the internet, of Google and Facebook and Wikipedia and WikiLeaks? Um, and digital cameras and so forth. And I thought, well, I know McLuhan pretty well. I mean, I'm not on his level, of course not, but uh, let's let's try it and let's see what happens. And so I sat down to write these essays 
which were far more skeptical about the internet then than I am now, because as I've, I've changed my opinion a bit, but the points made in the book are still nonetheless valid. Um, even though I have embraced the internet simply out of absolute necessity, there, there's no choice. We're not even given a choice. Uh, and that's one of the problems with this new media invasion. We, we're not given a choice. Um, update or die, update or perish. Update, allow Microsoft to hijack your computer every night uh, with updates or you don't get to, you don't get to compute. So it's very dictatorial. Um, so a lot of those points I made in this book I think are still valid despite the fact that I uh, I, I do love the internet um, but it, it is it, it's something worth questioning. I mean after all think, think about something like uh, Wikipedia, which I use routinely but simply because it's convenient and it's quick. but is it really an encyclopedia? And in fact it's not an encyclopedia. It's not composed of, actual information. It's composed of rumors about information. These are rumors that random individuals think might or might not be true. Uh, maybe Napoleon, in one version, lost the Battle of Waterloo, but then uh, you check again, maybe he won it. I mean, that's not, a, that's not information. When you have an unstable, quicksand-type shifting database of facts that can be deleted at a moment's notice, um, my Wikipedia page was deleted a long time ago. Um, for instance, that's not that's not an objective database at all. It's it's in fact it's a joke is what it is. Um, even though it does have its uses for simply for conveniences, if you want to know you know what the what all the songs on a particular Radiohead album are, you can just look at it and glance really quickly. So it's convenient for in that sense, but. You don't want to write a book with uh, citing Wikipedia because that's your, <laughs> especially if you haven't cross-checked it with print books, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. All right, so um, that's the overview of the class. Uh, that's what we're going to do, and I'll look forward to seeing you in class on Saturday and discussing this with you.